Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you are joining us uh, this afternoon. Um, we have registered uh, participants from 61 countries. Uh, I don't know how many of them will be here in person. We have people registered from Albania, Algeria, Bahrain, Bangladesh, Benin, Bolivia, Burkina Faso, Burundi, Cambodia, Cameroon, Canada, China, Cote d'Ivoire, Egypt, Iswatini, Ethiopia, Falkland Islands, uh, Fiji, Ghana, Haiti, India, Indonesia, Italy, Japan, Kenya, Korea Republic, Kosovo, Lesotho, Libya, Mali, Mozambique, Nepal, Nigeria, Pakistan, Papua New Guinea, Philippines, Rwanda, St. Lucia, Saudi Arabia, Sierra Leone, Somalia, South Africa, South Sudan, Sri Lanka, Sudan, Sweden, Switzerland, Tajikistan, Tanzania, Trinidad and Tobago, Uganda, United Arab Emirates, United Kingdom, United States, Vietnam, Yemen, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. So we hope uh, this uh, number of people can join us uh, in real time. Uh, to begin, um, before we get into the details of our conversation today, I would like to invite um, Martha Fan Joy, our program director here at Cori, to say a few words of welcome and to give us land acknowledgement. Martha. Thank you, Dagapi. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Um, what a list of, uh, of participant countries. Um, I think it really speaks to the, um, you know, the importance and, and the relevance of the topic we're all here to talk about today, uh, you know, building peace at home and abroad and looking at the opportunities and the risks for that, uh, given everything that's going on. Um, I'd like to start out by acknowledging that those of us who are joining from Cody today, oh. we're joining you from Mi'kma'ki the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people, uh, and also to recognize the harm, the past and the ongoing harm um, of colonial violence and exploitation. And I know, you know, given the list that Dagafi just read out, that we're all coming from many different spaces and many different lands. Um, so, you know, as we walk through this topic and we hear from the speakers today, uh, for the next couple hours, I'd ask all of you who are settlers on whatever land you're on, uh, if you are, to do some reflecting on what peace at home looks like when we're thinking through the lens of reconciliation, the lens of truth, the lens of what it means when we talk about um, recognizing past harms uh, when it comes to uh, colonization, when it comes to exploitation, um, and what our personal and what our professional roles are when it comes to acknowledging what it means to be on that land, whether you're acknowledging that you're on Mi'kma'ki, uh, here with us or, uh, you know, whichever land or space you're on today, because it's, you know, especially I was thinking about the topic uh, earlier today about building peace at home uh, and abroad. And I think at least in the space that we're in here at the Cody Institute, we've been thinking a lot about what it looks like to think about conflict transformation and peace abroad uh, over the past few months. And, and sometimes we lose sight a little bit about the work we need to do with peace at home. Uh, and the ongoing work and the ongoing learning we need to do when it comes to that. So I would just um, put out there that this webinar is a, a really um, timely opportunity to not just reflect around what's happening when it comes to peace and conflict transformation globally, but also on your own land and in your own space when we're thinking about reconciliation and truth and the work that we're all doing around decolonization. So with that, I'd just like to welcome you all. It's a um, a really exciting turnout and really looking forward to hearing the conversations that happen today. And I'll hand it back to you, Dagafi, to introduce our speakers. Thank you very much, Martha. Um, as Martha said, our topic of conversation today is building peace at home and abroad, identifying risks and opportunities. We are discussing peace today at a time when peace seems distant, unreachable, and even impossible. Time and again, our collective sense of peace and security appears to be punctured. The children who are caught up in this horror game of the grown-ups are imploring us, 
with their appeal for peace. They are asking and pleading with us not to punish them for our failure. We know it takes a village to raise a child. We also know it takes the world to provide children with peace and security so that they can live without fear. They can go to school, learn and play in a safe environment. We must realize that our decency and most of all our humanity, even our, our own civilization is not measured by how deadly our weapons are or how smart our weapons or sophisticated are. It is not by how many people these machines can kill or maim. It is how decent we are how we treat each other. Most importantly, our, civiliz our civilization will be measured by what kind of world we hand back to our children. We cannot be safe at peace here with the cries of children elsewhere. We can't pretend business as usual while part of our humanity Feels, feels pain. Indeed, these are dark days where hate, dehumanization, and disregard for human life is fused with political rhetoric. This path of hate and dehumanization harms us all. When we dehumanize the other, in the process, we also dehumanize ourselves. Therefore, we must find a way to be more human, more caring, and more listening. War and violence, war and violence is collective failure of humanity. As one of the greatest voices of peace, also known as the father of mindfulness, Tiktak Nahan once said, the way to peace is peace itself. Then, only then, we can say, we, the grown-ups, have taken our responsibility seriously and contributed towards the better future for our children and our only planet. World peace is our responsibility. And we must challenge the culture of violence and war. The discussion we will have today is focused in two areas. The role of diaspora communities in peace and conflict, and the role of religion in building peace. Even though politicians would like us to think of immigration as a new phenomenon, our human story is a history of immigration and migration. With that, we have fused our cultures, values, norms, and ways of lives. Asserting our relationship are not confined to certain geographic and political territories. Our lives are interconnected. How does this interconnectedness affect us in the context of peace and conflict? So, particularly in terms of peace and conflict in a world where religion and extremism, radicalism, etc., have become familiar terms, is there anything we can harness to build peace and promote coexistence through religious values? I hope in the next two hours we can identify a few areas and insights that will help us find our way to be more peaceful, more tolerant, and more willing to coexist. While we will be listening to our panelists today, for those of you who are listening, I would like you to reflect on the following. While you're listening, what stands out for you? What do you find challenging? What motivates you to act? I would like you to reflect, to think, while you're listening to our panelists. 
Our first panelist is Dr. Heather Eaton. Dr. Eaton is a full professor at St. Paul University, Ottawa. Here I have to make a full confession that that's my former school where I graduated from, my alma mater. Dr. Heather Eaton is, uh, has a PhD in ecology, feminism, and theology, engaged in religious response to the ecological crisis. The relationship among ecological, feminist, and liberation theologies and connections between religion and science. Committed to interreligious response to ecological crisis. Involved in conferences, workshops, teachings, and publishing in the following areas. She authored and edited books include Advancing Nonviolence in Social Transformation, New Perspectives on Nonviolent Theories with Lauren Levesque, The Intellectual Journey of Thomas Berry, Imagining the Earth's Community, 2014, Ecological Awareness, Exploring Religion, Ethics, and Aesthetics with Sigurd Bergman in 2011, Introducing Ecofeminist Theology and Ecofeminism and Globalization, Exploring Religion, Culture, Context with Louis Ann Lauren plus dozens of academic articles. She is on the board of the journal Worldview, Religions, Environment, and Culture, the steering committee of the Religion and Ecology Session of the American Academy of Religion, and past president of the Canadian Theology Society. Recent work includes as the intersection of religion, science, and ecology, and specifically among evolution, earth, dynamics, and religious imagination. Peace and conflict studies on gender, ecology, and religion, and animal rights, finally, nonviolence. Please welcome Heather Eaton to the podium. Heather. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Degafi. It's lovely to see you. Uh, hello to all of you, fellow panelists. Everyone in the little room there and the other panelists I can't see. First, thank you for organizing this event. I very much appreciate it. <clears throat> it's going to be a very important conversation. This is my contribution to our conversation. So mine, I'm going to look at this dialectic between religion, peace, which <clears throat> religion, peace, and violence we know is a dynamic and at times volatile combination. The role religion plays in violence and peace depends a lot on the era, the culture, the context, and the players. So what I'm going to offer are three different sections on this conversation, but the first one is, is the longest, and it's mainly about religion. When we talk about religion, what are we talking about? So it's easy for religious adherents to claim that their, religious, their religion supports specific acts of violence. So from crusades to witch burnings, to bombing abortion clinics, preventing women's reproductive rights, anti-LGBTQ+, or um, <clears throat> intifadas. So there's lots of ways we can, or lots of examples we can give that show that people will use religion for violence. But on the other side, we know there's the same amount who, in the name of religion, promote peace. They refuse military service. They speak truth to power. They call forth the beloved community. They engage in nonviolent movements and they go to prison for peace. So I recognize that we are a very international community today for this conversation. So my comments may not pertain to your context because we have come from so many diverse contexts. But we know that in every culture, there are people who are religious people who are peace activists and those who promote violence. All this we already know. I want to say a few comments about the North American context because that's the one I'm in and that's where the academic work I do on religion, peace and violence comes from for the most part. So <clears throat> post 9-11, in the post 9-11 world, the West, we can say the West, which is also European countries, suddenly became aware of Islam. And they began to make connections between Islam and violence specifically Islam and violence, 
And these were intensely scrutinized. However, they were not carefully scrutinized. Um, religious scholars such as Mark Juergensmeyer wrote books like with the titles of Terror in the Mind of God, The Global Rise of Religious Violence, God at War, <clears throat> and there were other publications, Religion and Terror, Post 9-11 Analysis, Holy Terrors, Thinking About Religion After September 11th. It, within five years, there was the Oxford Handbook of Religion and Violence, Violence in the World's Religious Traditions, the Princeton Readings of Religion and Violence, State Power and Violence, Martyrdom, Self-Sacrifice and Self-Immolation, and the Journal of Religion and Violence. And I say all that because this was a very, uh, an era of the beginning of really studying the relationship between religion and violence. And I'm going to do this first because this is relevant to religion and peace building. So all this attention to religion and violence and mainly Islam and violence and the carelessness um, used by many, including scholars that connected Islam and violence became really a problem. So then subsequent research started looking at violence in many traditions. So violence in Buddhism, Sikhism, Taoism, Confucianism, Christianity, Judaism. <laughs> Mark Jurgensmeyer, who at the time was, and probably still is considered one of the leading scholars in this area, he makes connections. He says religions that have apocalyptic visions that have um, images of cosmic wars between good and evil, who have a goal of the end times, tend to be more prone to violence than religions that don't, such as Buddhism or Confucianism or Taoism. In the end, however, this proved to be too simplistic. So I just want to say a couple of words about how religion is studied. So there are specific traditions. Religions are generally studied in specific traditions. They study their teachers, their texts, their traditions, institutions, temples, mosques, the mosques, the churches, the leadership, and who are the regulators. What is extremely odd, though, is that the phenomena of religion is rarely studied by religious study scholars or by theologians. What's difficult about this is then we end up in a conversation about religion and we say, well, what is religion? What is it? So we know from the perspective of the believers or what we call adherents, that there is some semblance of truth in their tradition and that we believe it. Now, of course, zealots or fundamentalists will believe it more strongly than those who are um, casual religious believers or people who just follow the customs of religion but don't really think about them. What's difficult in all of this though is that each religion claims universal and absolute truth. So this becomes an issue when we're talking about harnessing religion for peace or violence. And I wanna make a point that when religions are studied, they're studied differently from the inside or the outside, as we say technically. From the inside, you study your own tradition. From the outside, you study the phenomena of the a sociology of religion, psychology of religion, you study anthropology of religion, critical theories of religion, but for the most part, you're looking at the outside. Now, what's difficult is theology. It can be literal to the to fundamentalist, or and it can be fluid. But what I'm getting at here is that what we think religion is, is very important. What we think it is, how do we approach it? Do we approach it as sociology, anthropology? Do we approach it as a true believer? And of course, we have all of it. In every culture, in every tradition, we have a multitude of different approaches to religion. What I have found to be true over 30 years of studying all this is that what People are very, it's very difficult for people to define religion. So religious study scholars won't define it. And people who are in a tradition will define it according to their own tradition. But those who study a specific religion seem to not realize that most religions that we have come and gone into in human communities, there are more religions that have gone extinct than currently exist. 
in spite of the fact that they're all universal and eternal, they do go extinct. And this is in fact, uh, people don't actually understand that. They don't know that religions are fluid. They think their religions are static, immutable truth claims, that they have some separate form of knowledge, and that of course they have a universality and to some extent may be omniscient. But religions are actually historically transient. There are more religions that have gone out of cultures than are currently existing now. Any religion is an amalgam of other religions and worldviews. Uh, religions have to deal with science. They have to deal with philosophy and ethics. Uh, religions often are mechanisms of social, social control. They're shaped by historical events. They're adaptive and they are interpreted with new knowledge. For example, all religions are currently confronted with gender equality. I will say with absolute certainty that some have gracefully embraced that and many have not gracefully embraced that, but they still have to confront it in the same way religions have to confront ecological issues. So, Religions are like worldviews. That's the best way to understand them, not in terms of truth or teachings or text institutions. They're, they should be understood as worldviews. They're complex, they're dynamic, they're multi-layered, and we live within worldviews. And religions are symbolic par excellence. The best way to understand a religion is if we were to say, you know, I, I, I've taught theology, I've taught in religion, and students can be true believers and, you, and they really believe their religion is the truth. But if we thought of religions like languages, which one is true? So in this conversation right now, we have many different languages. Which one of those is the truth? So when we ask the question that way, we start to see the futility of talking about religion and truth, of which one is truthful. But as if we said religions are worldviews, well, then they go very deep because they are all about how we live. Do we embrace peace or violence? How do we organize our socially? What about gender relationships, birth, death, marriage? Uh, what do we value? Religions have a great deal to say about all of this. Uh, just as an example, I mean, people are not, they don't agree about how to live within a religion. So we have Christians who embrace simplicity, and we have other Christians that embrace the prosperity gospel. And they're both quoting scripture, and they're both quoting tradition. And then we have others who think that religion and finance have nothing to do with each other. And again, the question, which one of these is true? What is challenging in the conversation we're having today is that religions can go very deep into, into societies, but also individually. Religions, they seep into our identities. Who am I? Why am I here? What is my purpose? What is my destiny? All of this religious, religions have a great deal to say about all of this, and all of this can also be harnessed. Who am I? Well, you're a martyr. Who am I? Well, you're an agent of peace. Who am I? Well, you're a terrorist. Uh, you're a suicide bomber. So I'm not saying the religions teach that. I'm saying because religions can go very deeply into the worldview and into a person, who am I becomes a religious question if one is a religious adherent. Most people who studies religion would say religions and cultures are inseparable, that we really cannot ever have a conversation about religion without talking about which culture it's in, embedded in and how it functions in that particular culture. So we have Christians in Alaska and we have Christians in Texas and they do not believe the same things. And this would be true of any tradition that has uh, people in different parts of the world. The culture they're in is the greater influence than the religion they're in. So religions, when they are active, when they are um, living, we say, we call them living religions, they're active in the social imaginary, which means 
They can have a profundity. They have teachings of how to live, why we live. They can orient us to life's joys and struggles, but they orient us also ethically. They orient our emotions ethically. They they have a lot of personal ethics, particularly around uh, women. So I'm just going to say in some cultures, as many of you would know, uh, women, everything about them, how you dress, walk, look, talk, sit, uh, who you can look at, where you can go. This is all controlled by religion, but it's also controlled by the conservative culture it's in. So there's not a separation from religion and culture. So religions are personal, but they aren't individualistic. You can't change the ethical tenets yourself, especially in a homogeneously religious situation. So religions and the state, this is a dimension of religion beyond personal and social ethics. What is the relationship religions have with the state, which also has an impact of the relationship between religion and violence or religion and peace building? Um, conservative Islamic states right now are highly patriarchal and very homogenous or attempting hom to be homogenous. I live in, the, in Canada and we are seeing the rise of an alt-right Christian nationalism in the U.S. and beginning in Canada. So this is a very particular historical form of Christianity which is being embraced by the state. So the relationship between peace building and religion has a lot to do with violence and religion. We have, to, we have to be able to understand what is the state doing? What is the state's relationship? So I live in a part of the world where we're supposedly separating church and state or religion and state. Um, that's not what I see in the US. Uh, anyway, I won't get into Canadian politics because we'll never get out. I want to mention um, Afghanistan briefly an Islamic State, the control of women that the Taliban um, ostensibly, well, no, they're, they say they're faithful to the Quran. Um, other scholars say they're not faithful to the Quran, but I want to use them as an example. So this is, the United Nations has said the state of women in Afghanistan is the biggest human rights issue for women in the world. And it also is the country that has the most oppressive regime for women. And this is all in the name of religion. And this is where the human rights abuses of, of women are acute. And they say they are faithful to the Quran. And if anyone says otherwise, well, then you are an infidel or an outsider. So what does this mean for our conversation? You know, religions. Is, are they, is the Quran actually being appropriately manifested in Afghanistan? Or, as I would like to offer to our conversation, religions are simply harnessed by those who want to harness them in a certain direction. They harness the ideas, the teaching, the concepts, but for their own goals and desires, their own bias and prejudices. Religious content is both peaceful and violent in every tradition. You can find it somewhere in every tradition. None in, are inherently just peaceful or call for violence directly, but these themes are there. They can be called upon. You can quote from scriptures to promote peace, to promote violence. Now, what I find uh, frustrating is that religion, the way it's used usually in the popular press or in conversations, it's extremely naive. People have not given a lot of thought to what is religion. They say because some, you know, if someone quotes the Bible or the, or, or Hebrew texts or the Quran, that, that they're, they're saying some kind of truth that's obvious, except it isn't. It's imagery. It's potent imagery, but it's imagery that is often can be interpreted in multiple, even contradictory ways. Now, what is important around religious imagery and peace or violence is that criticizing, defiling, or destroying the religious imagery of another culture is very, very offensive. So we have recently seen the burning of the Quran, and that is blasphemous to a, to a Muslim. 
We know the Taliban blew up the Buddhist statues. These Buddhist statues were uh, 1,500 years old. They were absolutely incredible. And they blew them up because they said this was idolatry. Christianity has a just war theory. Islam has the um, intifada. Even in Buddhism, the term ahimsa, which is no, um, it really just means no, to, no injury. You can't harm another. And it is a primary virtue, ahimsa. However, even Buddhists will reinterpret texts in order to allow for violence or specific acts of violence. So Scott Appleby wrote an interesting book called The Ambivalence of the Sacred to say, you know, you can't just say religions are peaceful or violent because religions are neither peaceful nor violent. The people who use them are peaceful or violent. We talk about belligerent leaders. We talk about identity entrepreneurs who use religion. We look at state leaders like George Bush, who had the just war theory, which is a Christian theory, the just war theory rewritten so he could do a first strike in uh, the Middle East after 9-11. We now hear rhetoric in North America especially from the United States, that, of course, the Republicans are Christian and the Democrats are secular. And the Republicans are developing an, a very right-wing Christian nationalism that is anti-LGBTQ, anti-reproductive rights. Um, so, and they're doing this in the name of Christianity. And so the question to ask is, it, sorry, I'll rephrase that. It's actually not useful to ask if they are authentic, uh, if it's an authentic use of Christianity. And I say that as someone who knows the Christian texts quite well, you can you can actually uh, give your daughters for concubines. You can I mean you can have slaves. So, you know, you have to if you want <laughs> these texts all developed in highly patriarchal eras. So if you want to harness these texts for violence, there's lots there. But if you want to harness them for peace, there's also lots there. So I, the last section I want to do um, in the next few minutes is what about religion and peace builders? So to me, it's very clear that people use religions. They use it. They employ it. They harness it for their goals, dreams, vision, biases, prejudice, etc. There are certainly teachings within all religions about the common good. The common good is not a superficial image. The common good is, is that there has to be some shared reality that has justice and equity and well-being. It's the common good. All religions have teaching on nonviolence. Some more developed than others, but they all have teachings on not specifically nonviolence, non-interaction or resistance. All religions have teachings on dialoguing with the other. Whoever the other is, you, you're, it's an invitation to get to know them, to dialogue with them. There's an invitation to pay attention that difference is not threatening. It's not just tolerance of difference, it's that difference is uh, enriching. So there are always teachings there. Welcome the stranger, get to know them. There are teachings on having humility and uncertainty in front of truth claims. And so if you know, if you pay attention to those who harness religion for violence, they harness it with certitude and force. They're very bold. If you, if you, the, uh, the flip side of that is humility and uncertainty of our own truth claims and a generosity and an openness to learn. Something that um, Degafi's initial comments that I think are very important in this increasingly troubled world is, could we begin to pay more attention to who is an insider and who is an outsider? And just as an aside on this, the palace, the, what's happening in Gaza, in at least in North America, it, it is actually shocking how um, people people who say that what Israel is doing is too, is too aggressive. They're called, it's suggested that they are anti-Semitic, which they're not. They're talking about the actions. People who say we're very concerned about the Palestinians, 
they're accused of supporting Hamas. And that's not the case. But we're, but so the best of religions invite us to be careful, to be thoughtful, to to not judge, to not not that it's not clear that good, bad, insider, outsiders, that those differences are causing the conflict. It is a human tendency, and it has been studied that a lot, that we do have a tendency to objectify people who come from another tribe. That humans humans live, we like to live in communities. It's not so much like-minded as it is shared worldviews and shared values. And there is a tendency to be cautious with people with a different worldview and a different set of values. So that is something to be attentive to, is to how do we learn to be generous and open to the other? I will get come back to this. I'm almost finished. Uh, all religions have teachings on kindness, on do no harm, on generosity, turn the other cheek, which in Christianity means if someone injures you, uh, you don't retaliate. On forgiveness, which granted is a very difficult human act, but it is a part of all traditions. Reconciliation. So it, there's not they're not naive about living in some kind of false harmony, but how do we address conflicts differently than revenge? There are other teachings everywhere as well in each tradition about take no you take you do not take more than you need. So some of the greed of the world is having some people live in affluence and others live in extreme poverty. And this causes violence. This people will react when they are oppressed. So if we all took well I'm not naive anymore that I can say we should all take no more than we need but we should reduce what we take. It is very important to speak up against injustice. It is very important to speak for justice, for human rights, for dignity. Um, it is very important for religions to wade into politics. And I'm not talking about politics the way um, that we take, that we're partisan, but that we can speak truth to power to our governments, that we can call out government in action. We can press governments for justice. I think that's very important. Uh, I think it's important that we talk about ecological sustainability, that these are things that, that feed the common good. And the common good is one of the languages of peace and peace building. Now, of course, there's a couple of challenges I'm going to end with, is how far do we go around ethics to build relationships. For example, the treatment of women. To me, that's a non-negotiable. I'm not sure, I'm, I'm in a, th th there's inter-religious dialogue, intercultural dialogues, and there's ethics. Do Where do we speak up against injustices? What about religions and sovereignty? What can one say to a culture to say, well, those are that's unethical, and they would say, well, it's in the Quran, or it's in the Bible, or it's, what does one say? Uh, do I have the right to challenge a Muslim from Af So I teach a lot of international students. And do I have the right to challenge uh, someone from Afghanistan? Um, I will be a man on the treatment of women, but I'm not a Muslim and I'm not from Afghanistan. What about sovereignty, cultural diversity, cultural imperialism? I'm, you know, what happens to white supremacy? On what grounds do we challenge when we're talking about religion and ethics? How do I challenge the rise of the alt-right Christian nationalism in my part of the world? If I say, well, you're not acting according to Christianity, they'll just say that they are. And that conversation actually goes nowhere. Are they misinterpreting Christianity? Am I misinterpreting Christianity? Or is interpreting Christianity not the topic? The topic is the goals and values that they are espousing to which I object. I, I have two, one more short comment and then last sentence. This is something to think about and it's, it's a complicated topic, but it's worth interesting. So the religions, all religions have what we call otherworldly elements. So either the next life, 
the past life, returning to the Tao or the Great Spirit, uh, reincarnation or resurrection. There's all some form of continuing of continuation after our death. These are what we call otherworldly elements. Some say that the more the stronger those otherworldly elements are, the more likely people will ignore the difficulties and the injustices in this world. So it is something to think about. So if um, Christians engage in a great deal of violence because you know the next life is better anyway, that it 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 can prevent an ethic a restraint uh, on violence. Anyway, I'll leave you to ponder that. And the last thing I want to say is what brings religion into the peace building conversation is the commitment to peace and nonviolence. That's what brings it. It's not the religion that brings it. It's the people or the societies that bring it in. It's the people or, and societies have a commitment to the common good. It's not the religion that's the main driver. It's the desire for peace justice and equity. Those are the main drivers. Thanks very much. I look forward to the rest of the conversation. Um, Heather, thank you so much. You have given us uh, much more to digest, much more to reflect upon. Um, finally, you stated that that moral consistency, commitment to peace and nonviolence is the driving force uh, for any one of us to make sure that we're engaged and we are at the forefront of building peace and promoting the reconciliation and dialogue. Uh, I will come back uh, to the points after the panelists finish, uh, the rest of the two panelists finish their presentation. My next panelist is Dr. Barr Basser. Um, she joined Durham University's School of Government and International Affairs in 2021. Previously, she was Associate Professor at the Center for Trust, Peace, and Social Relations, Coventry University, where she led the Peace Building and Conflict Transformation Research Group. Prior to that, she was a doctoral research fellow at the University of Warwick at the Department of Politics and International Studies between 2012 and 2014. Dr. Besser completed a PhD in social and political science at the European University Institute in Florence, Italy. She is an expert in the area of diaspora, uh, diaspora studies, peace building and conflict transformation with a regional focus on the Middle East. She has conducted extensive research on diaspora engagement in peace processes, post-conflict reconstruction and state building in the global south. She has published extensively on a stateless diaspora, activism, and mobilization in Europe with a specific focus on forced states, counterterrorism policies, radicalization of diaspora members, and transnationalization of homeland conflicts. Dr. Baser is the editor of Kurdish Studies series published by Lexington Books and the co-editor of Diasporas and Transnationalism series published by Edinburgh University Press. She's also a senior associate research fellow at the Security Institute for Governance and Leadership in Africa. Stelbach University, South Africa, and visiting professor at Temporary Peace Research Institute, Temporary University in Finland. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bear Basel. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much uh, for inviting me to, to give this uh, talk, uh, especially uh, with these esteemed speakers. Uh, I feel honored to be here um, and I feel honored to be in front of you. Um, um, Professor, thank you so much for this really inspiring uh, speech about peace, uh, where you made it clear that peace is possible. So I'll try to build on that. Um, I am focusing on uh, diaspora, identity, peace and transplanted conflicts today as it was required for me uh, by the organizers and I felt um, um, really good about it because it made me understand that I've been working on these issues for uh, 16 years. 
Um, the first time um, I started working on uh, diasporas in pe peace and conflict uh, was uh, when uh, Professor Ashok Swain invited me uh, to a conference that he was organizing at Uppsala University. And I was just an MA student then, and uh, since then I'm in this topic. And uh, uh, Ashok and I then started working together. Uh, I spent another year in Uppsala um, researching how diasporas can build bridges between home and host countries and act as third party mediators for peace building. Um, it was um, a different time then, almost two, two decades ago. Uh, the field was uh, emerging uh, at the time, and uh, although many scholars and experts acknowledged the ascending role uh, that uh, diasporas play in world politics, uh, there was still a, a lot of suspicion and, uh, and doubts about the, um, the capacity that diasporas had. And um, when we started, there was also a semantic debate, and it lasted for a long time. So what do we mean by diaspora? How, how are they different from immigrants? Um, are, they, are diasporas transnational, or are all transnational communities can be considered as diasporas, etc.? Uh, but although we, we try to engage in an intellectual debate, uh, experts and policymakers started showing interest in this topic, and uh, they started coming up with their own definition of a diaspora and uh, you know you, we, we could see the European Union, IOM, UN you know they all had diaspora programs and suddenly the semantic debate uh, became uh, a little bit useless uh, because uh, whatever we said um, the policymakers moved on uh, but uh, what was interesting about those times was that um, as Ashok Manson mentioned in our backstage uh, chats, uh, it was a, it was a time when diasporas were were actually uh, securitized in uh, policymakers' speeches, but also uh, by the international organizations. Um, the um, because the nine eleven stigma was there, and the emerging literature. Uh, focused on how diasporas had these transnational ties, but those ties we can't really understand because they are not transparent enough. So diasporas send remittances back home, but how can we control them? How can we understand where this money is going? Uh, because of 9-11, but also other terrorist attacks in Europe around that time, uh, there was suddenly so much attention on understanding how these home homegrown terrorists in these host countries uh, were emerging. So radicalization, terror Tourism became the hot topic for uh, for policymakers who were interested in diasporas. So the debate was extremely securitized. Uh, but then uh, we had another uh, trend emerging, which focused on diasporas as social movements. Uh, and uh, it started looking at how diasporas can form transnational networks, which, uh, which acted like advocacy networks, how they show similarities to social movements, and how the diasporic space actually opens up space for uh, many uh, communities who are uh, suppressed back in their home countries. Uh, so suddenly the literature started treating diasporas as potential peacemakers, and we belong to this uh, trend as well, in my opinion, and how, how they can actually have positive contributions to, uh, to political processes at home and abroad. So uh, it looked like these two uh, trends were um, clashing in a way. So diasporas were depicted as either as peacemakers or peace wreckers. Uh, but at the same time, um, now I can see after two decades that most of this debate actually it was very Eurocentric and uh, because it always revolved around groups which were located in the global north. And, uh, and you know, most of the articles uh, uh, define diaspora mobilization uh, as transnational groups, uh, migrant groups who had uh, opportunities uh, in, in those global northern countries. So um, it, it was as if these diaspora members who came from different uh, countries in the global south didn't have any idea about how liberalism works, how democracy works, and how human rights and justice um, uh, work, and they come and learn it uh, in their new uh, countries of residence so that they can now uh, transfer those skills back to their home countries. So there was also this kind of a trend. Um, so uh, somebody, um, I think, immediately needs to decolonize diaspora studies literature as well. Uh, but um, but uh, this, this was the trend. And now the debate 
after uh, 20 years is more nuanced. And uh, we now know that diasporas can play versatile roles. Uh, they are heterogeneous, so we can't treat diaspora groups as monolithic bodies. Uh, there are many groups within a diaspora with different interests, sometimes overlapping, sometimes clashing agendas. And uh, it's more complex than we can understand. And we really need to study uh, their transnational landscapes in order to understand their um, uh, their capacity, but at the same time uh, to find a ways how, to, how we can engage with them. So um, I leave most of these discussions to uh, Professor Swain. I think he will address uh, these parts, but I'm just going to uh, say a few more things about diasporas and conflict, and I'll move on to the trans transported conflicts as I'm asked uh, to talk about. Um, so today we see many supranational organizations developing programs uh, addressing diaspora groups. As I said, IOM, UN, EU, especially uh, they uh, they uh, establish specific groups working on uh, you know African diaspora in Europe. Uh, young people, young leaders of African diaspora contributing to development projects, etc. So we see that at the supranational level. A positive um, approach is going hand in hand with the securitization policies. Um, so different programs are tailored for different uh, diaspora groups um, and uh, many actors, including homeland and hostland policymakers, they try to tap diaspora sources somehow. Um, so what is acknowledged now at the policymakers level, but also in academia, is that uh, diasporas keep their identities, they, they form transnational networks, uh, they are complex, they are multilayered, and uh, they get involved in peace and conflict, and they might have impact at home and abroad or at the international and supranational levels. They play versatile roles. Uh, when it comes to peace and conflict, we see that um, diasporas are really active for the full uh, conflict spectrum, for the full cycle, uh, including, um, you know, having impact uh, during the conflict, um, during the peace process, after the post peace records are signed, uh, at the trans transitional justice initiatives, and if uh, transitional justice, as we know it, doesn't take place, uh, they contribute to justice-seeking efforts. So, for example, uh, to give an example, um, uh, let's say uh, uh, Sri Lanka, so it uh, the conflict ended with Victor's peace, so now many Tamil groups are getting involved in justice-seeking uh, activities. When it comes to transitional justice and truth commissions, we know that the Liberian diaspora was actively involved in truth commissions, for example, um, uh, after um, uh, peace, peace accords are signed, let's say, uh, in the Colombian case, especially Colombian women in the diaspora are really trying to push uh, for reform. Um, during the peace processes, we have witnessed the Irish diaspora playing a major role uh, during the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, so these these examples can be multiplied. So um, what is overlooked in diaspora studies uh, for the last 20 years, in my opinion, is still the, uh, the inter-diaspora relations. So how do different diaspora groups interact with each other when they're outside their homeland? And uh, there are multiple examples for such relations. Uh, uh, for example, the Rwandan diaspora. Uh, different uh, ethnic groups uh, and uh, religious groups who migrated from Turkey, for example. Sometimes inter-diaspora relations uh, hit the headlines, especially when there's a violent conflict. But usually the situation is deeper than that. Usually there is cold peace, and we don't really understand the tensions uh, unless we really look for them. So I want to unpack uh, transported uh, conflicts a little bit uh, in this talk. Um, so... Um, um, transported conflicts, imported conflicts, transplanted conflicts. We see a lot of defini definitions in the literature, but they basically refer to situations where uh, disputes, issues, or tensions from one region, uh, culture, or context are carried over or introduced into another area or community. So in this case, by migration, conflict dynamics uh, can be reproduced in the transnational space in the new environment. Uh, if you think about migration, for example, especially conflict generated ones, uh, sometimes groups which are in conflict in the home country migrate uh, with, with similar opportunities, find themselves in the same setting again when they're abroad. And uh, because of um, 
where migrants are mostly located in metropoles, they find themselves in, in the same neighborhood again. So these kind of conflict dynamics are created again and again, reproduced uh, in everyday life, but also at the institutional and uh, national levels. Um, so these conflicts are transported, yes, uh, but at the same time, uh, we see sometimes in politician speeches, for example, um, migrants do not bring your conflicts, leave them in your home countries and just come here to become you know, new citizens, as if uh, conflict is like a commodity where a migrant decides, okay, I'm going to put that in my suitcase as well. My conflict is coming with me. So this is really not happening. Most of the conflicts are about identity, religion, uh, ethnicity. So they are embedded in who we are and how we define ourselves. So, so we cannot just leave them behind. And um, it's not a choice that they come with us. Um, and uh, in the new setting, in the host country or country of residence, uh, we see uh, these kind of dynamics are recreated again. Uh, but uh, scholars like Elise Ferron, or I also wrote about it in my book, which was published many years ago, um, these conflicts are not the same. There is always transformation. So these conflicts, while the dynamics are recreated, uh, they are also transformed according to the new um, new factors that uh, diasporas find themselves in in their new setting. So uh, Elise Ferron called this process uh, conflict auto autonomization. And uh, I think she had a point uh, because my research also uh, also showed that um, conflicts change, although the root causes might stay the same. So these transported conflicts display some similarities with home com homeland conflicts uh, in the myths, uh, symbols, values, or identity categories they rely upon. Uh, but these elements tend to acquire a different meaning in the diasporic context uh, than the one they have in the country of origin. So this process has been called conflict autonomization, um, which showed us transformation is inevitable. And I'll unpack this a little bit later, but we need to uh, understand this. Most of the conflicts uh, happen uh, in the form of civil wars nowadays. And uh, this entail... Um, uh, this entails minority-majority relations. So this means that there are uneven um, power relations back in the home country, uh, some kind of as, uh, as, asymmetric uh, power relations. And this can be uh, reproduced in the transnational context again. So structural inequalities can be recreated in the transnational space, especially, uh, for example, if one group is... Um, uh, you know, uh, considered as contributing to terrorism. Uh, so uh, uh, Professor Heather gave the example of Hamas, supporting Hamas, for example, in my own work, uh, it was the PKK. So, you know, these kind of um, uh, structural inequalities also exist, although they um, they extend borders. So asymmetries of power are reproduced as well. So leaving the conflict behind is not always possible. And uh, the diasporas constantly uh, try to reverse this, especially uh, diasporas, um, which can be um, defined as um, stateless diasporas like Tamils, Palestinians, Kurds. We we should we see that constantly they get involved in advocacy work to make a point. Or other diasporas, uh, such as Armenians, for example, constantly push for recognition of the atrocities they have uh, been subject to many years ago. So these issues are, of course, uh, transported to tr diasporic landscapes. Um, so the conflicts might emerge at the discursive level, um, at the institutional level, or sometimes we see uh, physical violence as well. So if you look at uh, diaspora, diaspora relations, uh, we see that there, there, there might be some triggering events which might um, in, in escalate conflict between uh, two um, adversary groups, let's say, without essentializing them. So it, it, there, there, there could be a football game, uh, for example, my research about Turkish and Kurdish diasporas showed that football games were really uh, <laughs> cr creating danger zones in some neighborhoods in Germany. Uh, so it, the, the Turks would support the Turkish national team and the Kurds just on purpose would wear uh, German national team shirts and go to this neighborhood and there were there, were, there would be violent clashes. So these were just like demonstrations of power uh, among different diaspora groups. But these kind of little triggers would actually carry this conflict to the he headlines and newspapers. Uh, in everyday life also, you know, there could be... Um, 
small gestures of conflict, including uh, not buying milk or egg from the supermarket next door because they belong to Kurds or things like that. If the if the supermarket had a Kurdish name, they wouldn't do that. Uh, from these small things to very high level protests and counter protests where people die. So uh, it 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 depends on uh, the time and the and the and the neighborhood where it happens, etc. But these things happened, and and we we all uh, have examples about them. So um, um, just to give you an example, for example, when I was in Sweden doing my fieldwork for my PhD uh, in a small municipality in Sweden, Armenian and Assyrian groups wanted to erect a monument to recognize the genocide. Um, and then the t Turkish group started uh, counter lobbying this um, and then the conflict escalated, escalated, never turned into violence, but it was a war of words. Uh, but in other cases in Germany, after the uh, after uh, uh, there was the acknowledgement of uh, Armenian genocide in the parliament, and then there were clashes between Turkish and Kurdish groups. So um, unrest at home might reflect uh, on the relations between diaspora groups, but also whatever happens in the new country of residence might also create new tensions. So Turkish and Kurdish groups might, um, or Armenian and Azerbaijani groups might might clash in a certain city, but the uh, these groups in another country wouldn't even have a clue why they were clashing. So th it it can be also the conflicts can be about uh, the home country as well. Um, so. Um, Apart from these other factors, uh, apart from diaspora diaspora relations, other factors have an impact on how the conflict evolves. Uh, especially the the outreach of the homeland is really important. So if you look at uh, uh, home states and how they engage with their diasporas for the last uh, 10, 20 years, uh, we see that many more states in the world are, are now uh, opening uh, specific ministries that are dedicated to diaspora affairs. Uh, there is this neoliberal trend of using diasporas as soft power tools. Uh, they all invest in public diplomacy and then they they use diasporas for diaspora diplomacy, quote unquote, and they basically try to reach out to diaspora groups uh, abroad, although they neglected them for many years. Uh, we see that especially uh, countries from the global south, which which many of them are considered as illiberal states, uh, they they are very keen to connect with their diasporas, and uh, this has uh, significant consequences on diasporic landscapes and uh, transported conflicts. Uh, home home states are more and more involved in transnational uh, spaces right now by. Um, uh, by uh, creating opportunities for diaspora members, empowering them by uh, by offering them resources uh, to get mobilized uh, for homeland interests. Um, they, they extend voting rights, uh, which are universal, they, which are beneficial for perhaps uh, all members of the diaspora community. But at the same time, there's uh, strong evidence that home states are um, supporting groups which are loyal to them, while at the same time trying to suppress uh, dissident groups. And this we can see in many, many cases from China to Turkey, from uh, India to Rwanda. Uh, we see that... Um, um, uh, whatever happens in the home country uh, has an impact on uh, diaspora relations. So if Modi or Erdogan gives a speech at give a speech at home, and if this uh, has a polarizing impact there, it also reflects on diaspora. But this doesn't stay there. Uh, we all know the literature about manufactured civil society in authoritarian context. So diaspora mobilization is very similar. So uh, home state manufactured diaspora organizations uh, sometimes act um, uh, on behalf of the state as brand ambassadors, uh, but sometimes it's not that innocent. They also monitor uh, and uh, spy on other individuals, uh, dissidents in the diaspora and uh, report them back home. Uh, so um, scholars coined this term transnational repression. So uh, repression tactics are, are not confined to national states' borders anymore, and uh, anymore, and they they can be transnationalized as well. So nation states learned how to cope with dissent, and um, and basically they they get involved and they they punish those who speak against them and they they reward those who are loyal to them, and this also deepens cleavages among uh, diaspora groups and. Uh, and the conflicts escalate because of that as well. 
uh, also the host country's uh, policies have an impact. So um, uh, host states can create opportunities for diasporas to mobilize. Uh, this could be economic, political, or social, uh, or just discursive. So some stateless diasporas really benefited from this. And, uh, you know, uh, at times that they're not stigmatized, they actually made their voice heard. So, for example, now that the conflict has escalated in Israel, uh, between Israel and Palestine, uh, we see that in some countries uh, it's very hard for Palestinian diaspora to speak up, uh, but it wasn't the case before. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, the the space that the host countries provide to diaspora groups might change over time according to host states' uh, foreign policy priorities, etc. So everything is fragile and everything is fluid. So diasporas try to adapt to these changes, but at the same time, host countries also um, try to control diaspora voices. Uh, it's always the nation state's interest that's uh, on top of the agenda, both for home state and host state actors. So um, um, for host countries, it's also a soft power tool. So for example, the British Council is constantly organizing um, diasporas and peace building seminars, inviting uh, members of Somalian or Zimbabwe diaspora. But uh, this is also uh, happening with goodwill, but also this promotes British interest in the region. But also it shows that successful diaspora groups uh, can represent the, the British way um, outside its borders. So these examples can be multiplied, but uh, there are many things that host and home countries can do to um, to de-escalate conflicts between diaspora groups. But sometimes uh, their actions are the actual cause for the escalation of these conflicts. And I can unpack this a little bit later. So is resolution or mitigation possible? Uh, to, uh, is Can we resolve uh, transplanted conflicts? Um, how, how do we end these? So uh, let's talk about like real life um, examples a little bit. So in 2022, for example, there were major clashes in Leicester in the UK uh, between Hindu and Muslim groups, uh, which lasted for days. <coughs> and uh, those and so participants were arrested as a result of these clashes. And uh, basically, we could see that, uh, you know, they were burning religious symbols, damaging mosques and temples. So the typical transported conflict we see in, in media outlets. And um, this happened because of the tensions between those communities in Leicester in the UK. But at the same time, they were um, they were affected by what was happening in their home countries. Uh, another altercation, recent altercation happened after the murder of um uh, a, a few Kurdish diaspora members uh, when a right-wing extremist attacked them in Paris. And uh, the Kurds were protesting against this because they thought that the French state could actually prevent this from happening. Uh, and then uh, some Turkish groups organized a counter-protest and there were clashes again. Um, so when things are violent, they are addressed by policymakers. When there is no violence, uh, the policymakers just turn a blind eye to these tensions flying in the air. But uh, what is interesting for me is that just the two examples I've given you, uh, I can add another one from the US context uh, during the Nagorno-Karabakh war, war, for example, uh, there were some clashes in Los Angeles between uh, Azeri and uh, uh, Armenian diaspora members. So these clashes happened uh, in countries uh, that have democratic institutions that provide opportunity structures to diaspora groups for mobilization and action, yet their citizenship regimes and migrant incorporation strategies are strikingly different, but this happened. Uh, so uh, there is no one recipe, there's no one solution to transported conflicts. They can happen anywhere, anytime, depending on the triggers. triggers. So... Um, Although citizenship regimes, opportunities, etc., define um, the repertoires of action that diasporas might take, as long as the root causes are there and as long as the homeland conflict continues, there is always a, a potential. And uh, this is not just violent, but um, uh, um, as I said, Cold War or negative peace might be always there. 
Um, so just to uh, summarize a little bit, um, when we talk about diasporas, we um, we tend to focus on people who migrated from one place to another, but it also has a, a temporal dimension. So it, 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 diasporic identity um, is inherited by the future generations. And we see at protests, we see um, <laughs> in diaspora mobilization activities, we see many um, people who have never experienced the homeland conflict. They still actively join and they still become either memory entrepreneurs or uh, activists within the diaspora context. So diasporic identities and collective trauma, uh, these kind of emotions are also transmitted to uh, the next generation. So host countries might prefer to treat uh, transplanted conflicts as something that's coming from far away. And uh, that can be treated if the homeland conflict is uh, uh, done and dusted. But um, uh, as these generations are uh, born in the new context and they experience uh, this hybrid understanding of uh, of the conflict, it's not very easy to resolve. So the host countries need to understand the dynamics uh, between diaspora groups, and then they should act uh, accordingly. So um, just uh, final words about how to resolve those conflicts. Uh, I would say many initiatives, uh, what we've seen so far is that diasporas are either uh, expected to stay as spectators to peace building activities or they are called um, to to act in a specific moment so why don't you come and testify at the truth commissions but then you know we give you this much space and you can't do further than that so their activeness and agency uh, might not be recognized by any of the actors who are involved in this uh, uh, peace building activities so I would say that um, uh, NGOs, uh, peace builders and policymakers, they should not uh, just be okay with cold peace or negative peace among diaspora members. They should understand that uh, uh, what we need is not uh, a conflict management or conflict resolution approach, but conflict transformation approach uh, inspired by Lederach's perspective. And uh, to, to achieve that, we shouldn't just focus on the moment when the peace process happens, etc. but we should invest in long-term activities and we should encourage diasporas to engage in uh, conflict transformation-inspired activities rather than just focusing on one moment. And um, we should be as inclusive as possible. This would be my second recommendation. Uh, so we see that uh, home, home countries usually ignore dissidents. Host countries ignore uh, groups which, which are perceived as terrorists or um, which are perceived as, let's say, not integrated enough. But uh, if they don't have a comprehensive approach, these conflicts will never be resolved. So. You asked me a question uh, when you invited me to this uh, webinar, diversity as a liability, then an asset and a, and a question mark. So I say that uh, each actor tries to turn diasporas into an asset by using uh, differential treatment among diasporas. So for each actor, uh, some segments of diaspora is a liability, some segment of diaspora is an asset. Uh, but uh, in reality, diaspora mobilization is real and diasporas are heterogeneous. So all actors need to learn to live with it and get used to this uh, synchronous uh, transformation that they will go through as diasporas uh, are rising. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Better, thank you so much for your sharp and very um, uh, clear analysis of diaspora issue with, it, with all complexities and with all its challenges. Uh, and you will come back to that. And just to, before I turn into Dr. Swain, um, Ashok and I met in Toronto in 2006 for the diaspora conference. And I clearly remember uh, at that conference, the keynote speaker was um, Armenian foreign minister. His opening sentence was, a diaspora is self-identifying term. Uh, it's not somebody can call you diaspora or not. If you don't choose to be identified as diaspora, it's up to you to choose. So um, Dr. Ashok Swain is, uh, uh, I have known him for a long time uh, and I have a privilege uh, occasionally interacting with him through my podcast. He's a professor and head of the Department of Peace and Conflict Research and UNESCO Chair of International 
Water Corporation at Uppsala University in Sweden. He also the founding editor-in-chief of peer-reviewed journal Environment and Security, published by SAGE. Dr. Swain received his PhD from the Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi in 1991, and since he has been teaching at Uppsala University. Dr. Swain has been the MacArthur Visiting Fellow at the University of Chicago, Visiting Fellow at UN Research Institute for Social Development, Geneva, and Visiting Professor at the University of I'm going to butcher this name, with Water Sand, University of Science, uh, Malaysia, University of British Columbia here in Canada, University of Maryland, Stanford University, McGill University, Tuft University, and University of Natural Sciences and Life Science in Vienna. Dr. Swain has written extensively on new security challenges, international water sharing environment, conflict and peace, and democratic development issues. He has also worked as a consultant on environment and development issues for various UN agencies, OSCE, NATO, um, EU, IISS, Arab League, Oxfam, uh, governments of Sweden, Netherlands, UK, and Singapore. Dr. Swain, the mic is yours. Thank you, Digafi. Uh, thank you, Baha. Thank you, Professor Return. It's been um, an also for. Uh, thank you, the audience, that you have been still here. Um, it's my pleasure to speak to you on this topic. Uh, of course, the kind of things which uh, you gave a long introduction, it doesn't say anything what I'm, I do on DAS, but of course, we. Uh, um, so what I'm doing here, uh, besides being a diaspora, um, the thing is, uh, the time, uh, I, I will tell you a little story. I won't take much time because I think we would be better off having discussion. Uh, in the 90s, uh, um, when I was in um, doing research in uh, here in Uppsala, there have been a number of uh, invitation for me to up, uh, join the research projects of diaspora research project, and I, that never inter gave, you know interested me because the reason was this diaspora is doing better than that diaspora. That's I think that is more. Um, I found it a bit more xenophobic or a bit more uh, elitist of some kind of groups. Uh, so I, I, I decided not to do that. Uh, and I think, as you as you mentioned, the cafe, that in 2006, there have been world started changing, looking at diaspora in a different way. Because since before that, diaspora has been looked at in a small group uh, and some time of troublemakers. But I think then we realized that the Diaspora number is increasing. Uh, it's quite, uh, if you look at it, uh, the world has changed. Uh, I mean, if the latest figure is 281 million people, those who are born outside their country, living in the host country. So it's a 280 million, 81 million. I was uh, part of a UN project four years back. And I think if we really calculate that number, it, if by 2050, this number might doubled if we take the climate change and other migration into account. So imagine the kind of people, those who are already there, part of the diaspora and the new migrants are coming. So the number will be huge. And I think we do, are not talking anymore, small group of people in small countries or bigger in the West, they are moving everywhere. Uh, it's a, We might be uh, stopping or securitizing our border in Europe, or you might be securitizing your border in North America. But that doesn't mean that people are not moving. People are moving to the other countries. So that is uh, the kind of countries which probably was not re receiving refugees before or receiving migrants before. So things are changing in a very, very dramatic way, particularly in, the, uh, in that sector. Unfortunately, the countries are not prepared, particularly countries in Europe. The countries in Europe have been traditionally a single race, single nation country. Uh, and I think they are not yet uh, getting into this uh, kind of idea that the, the dynamics have changed, whether they accept it or not. Country like Sweden, where the 10 to 20 percent, depending on how you count it, the number of people are born from outside the country. This was a country which was thinking it's a Christian country. That's why they allowed the I mean, they have been going on for this in the name of freedom of speech, Quran burning. But if you look at it, there is a, a six to ten percent are Muslim population. So there is no such 
respect for the minority rights or minority sentiments. Uh, and I think these are the things which we need to realize that these countries are not the same as anymore. Uh, I, I will give a couple of examples. The last week, week this weekend, Saturday, it was a, a, the Sweden's number two party, party number which is uh, right wing, far right wing, uh, saying that it will demolish mosques and all the Islamic, uh, you know, uh, monuments. Uh, there are few things. This is the way they will do it. But who will do it? How will do it? All right. Yesterday, uh, one of the mainline newspaper calls Greta Thunberg a girl Hitler. This was absolutely unthinkable. This kind of uh, ideas, this kind of uh, terminology, this kind of uh, discussions, this kind of uh, discourse in a country like Sweden. I have been living in this country more than anyone else. Um, uh, and the kind of, uh, uh, so the, I think the, the dynamics have changed in this country. And then if you go to the countries, I myself was, uh, I, I mentioned, I started doing the research in 2006, how the diaspora can be, uh, rather than looking at conflict, how diaspora can do peace. Uh, and Bahar was mentioning, and we did a lot of work, and you know there has been. Uh, I mean, that was the time when a time when you thought that look, this is this is some things we do research on. There is a lot of hope. There was a lot of hope in the world. Democracies were growing. Then we were thinking things are moving in the right direction. That was the time when we thought that this 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 is moving in that direction. Unfortunately, things have dramatically changed. Uh, I will give you another example. 2016, I wrote a, I, I signed a contract agreement with a book publisher to write something about Indian diaspora. Uh, you know how the Indian diaspora in Canada, this is the one of the reasons that has been India, Canada, bigger conflict is going on, um, which uh, your prime minister uh, brought up this issue at the parliament. And since then, India, Canada relationship has gone really bad. Uh, this is the similar issue has come now, exactly similar, which they have not able to kill uh, in in US. So these are the diaspora conflict. 2016, when I wanted to write the book about the Indian diaspora, because Indian diaspora, which we all know or we all glorify it, that it is the ideal diaspora, isn't it? That's the ideal diaspora, which has been quite successful economically, uh, uh, follows the rule of law in this country, has been uh, politically active, socially engaged, all kinds of things. So you, you name it, you, it should be ideal diaspora. But I thought something is wrong somewhere. What is going on? And uh, wh how, what kind of role they are playing back in the country? And that's why when I had to write a book, I took uh, two months, went into Bay Area in California, spoke to several of the big shots in the guys those who are really playing a big game in the American politics uh, because that time nobody knew me I mean uh, I, I look I, I'm, a, I'm a Hindu upper caste uh, and I can play a very uh, nice way that uh, I'm stupid so th those things that really worked uh, uh, but when after getting some of the interviews by that time I was gradually, they come, came to know because I was writing in the other newspaper critical of what is happening in India. Uh, after that, nobody wanted to talk to me. There was nothing. So I stopped that book project. Of course, I will come back to that book project sometime when the things will get better if I survive. But this is where the situation is, that it is extremely difficult to point out which diaspora is good, which diaspora is bad. It's a very, I think the definition, uh, Bahar has been mentioning, the definition is very complex. Uh, some of the diaspora can be good, some of the diaspora can be bad. How we really look at it, which group we are looking at, in which country we are looking at, what sort of diaspora ways behave in a certain way for the host country, but behaves completely different to in the home country. What kind of measurement, what kind of, uh, our role as a host country should be whether we should look at how they are behaving in the home country or ho sorry host country or how they are misbehaving in their home country uh, so this is some kind of 
uh, discussions, arguments have come in. And I think uh, this is somewhere we do have to see how it's moving. Let me tell you a tell you few things. What is happening? Diaspora, how diaspora leading to the conflicts? Uh, that, that has been a lot of research has been done. And we all know that diaspora has been contributing to the conflict for several decades or ages, and it still continues. We saw that in the Syria case. There is a, lots of research on the Tamil diaspora in the Sri Lankan civil war. Even Bahar, myself, and Fiergal Cochran, we wrote a paper on that one. Uh, Bahar has written on the Armenian diaspora Nagana Karabakh conflict quite a lot. Uh, to be, you know, uh, strangely, in, 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 in a, some 10 to 15 years back, I was in my office, I got a telephone call from the uh, uh, Azari foreign office. Uh, a big guy from there called me, said, can you help us? Because Armenian diaspora are being uh, organized, they are helping the country. Can you tell us how we should organize our diaspora to counter Armenian diaspora? I said, I'm not in that kind of business to do these kind of things. So please find someone else. Uh, but this, this is where uh, how, the, how the politics, diaspora politics has gone. Um, and th this is, and also we know how the role of Irish diaspora, of course, right? because the diaspora which I am talking are contributory conflict. They are also contributing to the peace. So it's not that they are only contributing to the conflict. So the Irish diaspora has a number of, uh, you, if you look at it, it has uh, particularly in the United States provided significant support. That also we wrote. Uh, and fundraising, political advocacy, and some cases, always arm procurement also they did for the IRA. So it, they have got, I mean, these are the Irish diaspora in the United States. We're not talking about the Tamils or Somalis or uh, uh, whatsoever. So this is where we can, you know, in, in a conflict, you cannot say that which diaspora will go to which extent. It's very difficult to put that. Somali diaspora, which is being also being uh, being written by several that uh, it has been involved in supporting various factions in the ongoing conflicts um, uh, Somalia. Let's everybody now is an expert on com com Israel Palestine. Um, so the Jewish diaspora has been. Um, I think it's a Jewish and Palestine diaspora. Uh, let me give a minute uh, on how things are developing here. Uh, Jewish diaspora has been quite uh, active uh, in a protecting uh, Israel's interest uh, for a long period of time in this part of the world, in your part of the world, in all over the world. And this has been extremely active. There is some changes has have taken place in the recent conflicts, particularly. Of course, it has been Jewish diaspora has been divided when the before October 7, there were 40 weeks of pro-democracy movement was taking place in Israel. So you could see that the Jewish diaspora was quite divided, uh, particularly in the United States and in the Europe. But then that part of that Jewish diaspora also remained divided now after October 7. You will see there is a significant younger Jewish uh, groups are also opposing what is happening in, 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 in Gaza or is happening in the West Bank. Uh, so they are as vocal as anyone else can be. At the same time, the Palestinian diaspora, I mean, I have been, uh, I remember, I don't know why, I was giving, I was being invited quite a few times to the Arab American graduate uh, group in the in North America to give talk, but I was talking about water, I forget, I mean, not that much in the 90s. So, and I saw that how minimum that group is, how minimal that group is. But that has really expanded in a, in a influence and networking and in the number in the, in the recent conflict or ongoing conflict showing. So there is a, we see a divided Jewish diaspora at the same time, a bigger, larger network Palestinian diaspora coming in. So in this conflict, it, it, it's, it depends on which side you are. That's up to you. But I think there's a diaspora role and actions have changed quite dramatically in this way. Um, then there is a Cuban diaspora and which has been, um, uh, we need to also take, have, look, this has been always, Cuban diaspora has been one of the major factor of prohibiting good relationship between developing between United States and Cuba. 
despite Castro's have died, despite a number of things. I mean, Americans have made friendship with all kinds of people, but this, the Cuban diaspora has been prohibiting having a proper, a proper relationship. Afghan diaspora, this is also somehow, we need to look at it, how that is behaving. Afghan diaspora, of course, I mean, uh, uh, I think uh, Professor Eaton was talking about, uh, no one is going to uh, any way so, uh, justify or even sympathize what is happening with the, uh, in, in Afghanistan. That's the, on, the, on the gender issue. That's absolutely no, no. Uh, but then we need to also see how the Afghanistan diaspora has behaved before or at the time of occupation, American occupation, and after American withdrawal. And I think it is also, I don't think they do have, they, they, play, they have played a positive role in the Afghan, Afghanistan issue. And now, instead of, I think I, I do see that it is, there is, because after 20 years, you can change the Taliban. Taliban has taken off the power. It is better to actively engage and convince or try to put pressure being engaged rather than being thinking that you will one day again occupy that country and you will change that. That's not going to happen, at least not in my lifetime. So this is where it is, it, 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 the situation is. Uh, then this is the remittance over here. I'm talking about in the money. And I think uh, there was just somehow uh, Bahar was talking about the remittances, like uh, making, taking the good things from these countries and taking, going that, that's positive remittances. But there have been a lots of negative remittances have gone in. We don't need to even decolonize it. It's, it's a, because look at it, what is happening. Many of the diaspora coming from the South Asia, coming from Southeast Asia, work or even Africa, Muslim diaspora working in the Gulf countries. The kind of remittances, the religious fundamentalist remittances they are taking home, that has creating all sorts of trouble in various parts. So we also need to know that this diaspora, I, I mean, the Western diaspora, of course, has certain kind of uh, other negative remittances. I'm, I don't have the time to get in there, but that's much more. This is a very clear cut case that what is happening. Then the political lobbying, they do it. Like, as I was mentioning, Cuban American does do that. Jew, Jewish diaspora does that. The Ethiopian diaspora, I haven't come to that uh, dig up, but you know that very well, that how this has been a part of the big group on the political lobby. In the conflict, even in the conflict in the Nile River conflict with the uh, Egypt, uh, or in the internal conflict, what happened in Tigray, or it's happening in Amara. So it's, it's, it's internal conflicts also, they are, they are playing their role. Uh, Indian diaspora, um, lobbying, I mean, uh, depending on the, the Indian diaspora I was mentioning, their support to the conflict, India's conflict with Pakistan, uh, nuclear issue, or even in the case of Kashmir, or in the case of Punjab, it's absolutely, and the, what is the case in Manipur, they are playing a certain kind of lobbying that to protect India, but also to in, keep the conflicts going. They are not putting any way positive pressure to make these conflicts um, diminish. Uh, they spread propaganda, there has been a recruitment and training, and there is a cultural and ideological polarization. I don't have the time to go into all these things, but a very different ways they do it. But nowadays I have been, my, my students think that I have become quite pessimist. I don't bring hope. Uh, and I think the world at present needs some hope because I think the way things are moving, the way things are going. I mean, of course, if you look at it, we need something to see, to keep, to latch on to. At least there is a time, this time will go away and we will be, feeling hopeful about the people generation, younger generation will be able to take that, you know, uh, uh, go ahead with this. So then diaspora groups has been, of course, the diaspora, if you see the remittances, the financial remittances, it is now $100 billion or more annually. It's a huge amount of money. The kind of money which can really protecting a number of countries' economy. And of course, it is susceptible to different kind of economic issues in the um, uh, remittance sending countries, but it helps this country's economy. There is a lot of skill and knowledge transfer is taking place. The countries, those who have been devastated with the war, uh, misrule, uh, misgovernance, if there is a possibility, unfortunately, there are not many countries which are being democratized now, rather than who is taking place, who's are taking place in Africa, as if 
like it was been um, you know um, in the 1980s 60s but if they do there is a possibility of the skill and knowledge transformation the transfer there is a promoting of peace and reconciliation they can act mediators i think we wrote a paper uh, bahar and i wrote a paper long time back how how these uh, diaspora groups can act as a mediators in the conflict resolution processes in peace building processes how the uh, host countries can um, take their uh, um, contacts take their uh, uh, um, relationship to make some deals with the conflict countries in the conflict and they can also be part of the peace building processes and we have seen that if they can be accepted by the host country they can really play a role uh, they also take the investment and entrepreneurship there are many diaspora look at what has the chinese diaspora has taken from the this part of the world and taken to china what sort of entrepreneurship they have taken and how the made the china is a very different place on on i'm just talking about entrepreneurship so this is the diaspora which has able to make then there has been a cultural exchanges and diplomacy uh, they can promote cultural understanding between the countries there is a lots of things the ways they can really promote so these are the things which i think uh, uh, we need to realize that uh, migration or the diaspora has a number of positive effect the countries those who are uh, trying to see in this part of the world they need migration that is a need for the economy that is the need for the society the countries are the pop they need the their 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 whole society to function in many ways and also economy to grow uh, so it's not that the uh, we need to look at it also the success stories the contributions the migration or diaspora makes uh, of course we need to see how that diaspora can be positively contribute to the peace and development what the host country and home country can do towards this unfortunately there is a little less coordination between host country and home country on that and there is that's why there is a number of cases host country and home countries are using diaspora for their own interest and i think it's a better than rather than blaming diaspora we should blame this politics and politicians those who are in the host country and home country are misusing or mismanaging the diaspora which is a great resource particularly for not only for these two countries but for also all sorts of knowledge creation um, the wealth generation you name it and and uh, also keeping the society alive and economically successful i will stop here uh, but i think it it's a somehow it is important that we need to uh, uh, express ourselves show ourselves the success of migration success of diaspora particularly when the far right groups are really running like anyway all over the world and particularly in this part of the world and in your part of the world too thank you i'll stop here thank you very much for your uh, detailed reflection on the potentials and challenges of diaspora i would like to uh, begin with um a few points that i put together in terms of uh Ah, there it is. Peace building in the context of being here and there. Uh, being here and there is referring to the diaspora point. Uh, both of you, Dr. Barr and Dr. Uh, Swain, discussed uh, that the art of being here and there. Diaspora navigating homeland and the country of origin. The issue of second and third generation. Who is a good diaspora? Who is not? a good diaspora who is uh, used for particular uh, home government policy issue and the country of origin policy issue this is particularly interesting for me because uh, over the last couple of years i have managed to travel to my country of origin uh, the country of my birth and be part of um, some kind of rebuilding some kind of peace making and reconciliation processes uh, interestingly enough uh, you know we as a diaspora whether we identify ourselves as diaspora or not the fact that uh, i mentioned earlier that is self identifying term as soon as i land in ethiopia whether i like it or not i am diaspora because the community calls me diaspora uh, the the desire what i think is salman rushdie who called it 
diasporas always attempt to swim in two ponds at the same time, uh, which is not possible. Uh, so uh, going back for diaspora is also some kind of discovery, some kind of coming face to face with reality that you are not really, some of the goalposts have moved, some of the physical memories have changed, some of the structural realities have the new formation and new grounds for <coughs> diaspora. So what we imagined homeland, you know, uh, imaginary homeland and reality become complex and incompatible sometimes. Uh, but nonetheless, the potentials of diaspora in terms of building peace, uh, knowledge exchange, transferring skills and expertise are real potential at some point even UNDP has try to explore and to facilitate that kind of back migration into the country of origin. However, the challenge we face within the diaspora context is our concept in the country of adapted homelands, the concept of freedom of expression, the concept of uh, democratic exercise, the concept of many other social and political contexts differs when we go back to the country of origin. And it makes us unsettled. It makes us restless. It makes us uncomfortable even. So navigating those tools and making sure that uh, we are adaptable again, it's sort of that reverse adaptation, we go back to the country of origin and making sure that we fit in uh, in one way or the other. But questions remain in that, in that regard. Dr. Dr. Uh, Heather uh, Eaton gave us a very detailed examination of religion, that double-edged sword, religion, depending on who is interpreting it, depending who is looking at religion for their own political or any other purposes. But the reality we face today in our world is religion, uh, uh, secular state, uh, the, the distinction between the states and church have become very blurry, even, even in democracies. And we face lots of challenges in that sense. So uh, we are very pleased that you, three of you have come to share with us uh, a, a detailed analysis of your expertise and your knowledge. But here you see religion diaspora being here and there and transpla transplanted conflict. But the other thing we have to remember is that, if you can put the next slide, is let's look away from the mainstream media, away from uh, what the media is telling us. At the moment, there are almost 114 active armed conflicts around the world, 114. In Africa, there are 35 conflicts. In Asia, 21. In Europe, yes, in Europe, there are seven conflicts. Latin America, six. Middle East and North Africa, 45. So over the last year, 237,000 people died. This is from Uppsala University. The source is Uppsala, Dr. Swain's University. 237,000 people died in armed conflict majority of them in Ukraine and Ethiopia. That is a very, very conservative uh, estimate, and the numbers could be double than that. But look at this map. Uh, Ethiopia, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Sudan, Libya, Mali, India, Pakistan, Iran, Iraq. These are active conflicts taking place at the moment. Next slide, Kenya, Somalia, Yemen. Uh, so this, what we hear from mainstream media are not the only conflicts happening in the world, and we should be aware of uh, uh, other conflicts and other devastations people are facing around the world. A little bit marketing I have to do now, just quickly, in relation to the next slide, in relation to what we are trying to do here at CODI. At CODI, we have a number of courses we provide, number of teachings. Uh, you can see on this list, uh, that, that are hands-on and practical tools that will help communities around the world make sure that they can harness their cultural, religious, and social values and make sure that 
uh, building networks and focusing on justice, whether it's economic and political, is important. Uh, next slide, please. Peace building and conflict transformation. All of you have talked about this. And we are providing four different courses here at CODI. The first one is a grassroots peace building, a short-term online course. And the next one is women, peace and security, and climate emergency, peace and conflict, economic justice, and peace building. So these are the courses we are providing at CODI Institute. So in order to move away from pessimism, uh, to be uh, away from hopelessness, as Dr. Swain mentioned. We are trying uh, daily in, in, in every context that making sure that we provide people with tools, uh, harness their own capacity and build networks and make sure that we have contributed our fair share in terms of building peace around the world. Uh, Cody Institute have been active since 1959 and we have more than 10,000 graduates around 146 countries, and three of you will be added to that network from here on and as, as we expand our, uh, our network around the world for peace, development, and justice. So with that, uh, uh, Brian, we have a few questions we can uh, share with our panelists and use the remaining 10, 15 minutes for Q&A. Sure. So the one question that came up on the uh, chat room uh, was, how does religious diversity impact efforts to build peace both locally and internationally? That probably is a question for Heather, right? Yes, it came up after her talk, yes. Did you hear the question, Heather? I did, yes, and I saw the question um, before. <clears throat> um, I'm not exactly sure how specific the question is because Religious diversity is everywhere within traditions and uh, among traditions. And it, it, there is no answer, like religious diversity, if people are allies and they work together and they share analyses and they build friendships and community, they can work very well together. It depends on how close the community is and how how much they use their religion to keep their identity or ethnic boundaries really, you know, are they porous or are they really tight? So there isn't, you know, I've been to Africa many, many times, South Africa, Botswana, Kenya, um, Namibia. These are, I mean, these are religiously diverse countries. Uh, all kinds of different religious expressions coexist without conflict. So it's, of course, it's possible. It will depend whether, you know, is, the, is a country entering an intrastate or interstate conflict, then identities become reified. And we talk about identity entrepreneurs. We talk about belligerent leaders who will then use religion to say, are you with us or against us? It's us or them. It's right or wrong. And as soon as one starts to see these dichotomies, in conversation, one should be getting nervous because dichotomies are not the reality. Diversity is the reality. Plurality is the reality. Everywhere in the world, it's plurality. Even in homogenous communities, it's plurality among what people think, feel, believe. Um, even if the community looks homogenous, it probably isn't at it if you really start probing. So to me, diversity is the norm. The question is, how do people, how tribal are they? How tightly will they keep their boundaries, their identities? So when I, the approach I took to religion today was to point out that it's really a lot about identity and it's about how the boundaries are. People use religion, how tight they make the boundaries and how, what do they harness religion for? Well, the, what, what we do know is that identities become reified or rigid. Um, religious beliefs become rigid. This is in the pre-conflict stages. In the conflict stages, it's all kinds of things. And in the post-conflict reconstructions, people try to go back to a more flexible worldview, more or less successfully. The, the second question we had in the chat room was, do you think host countries must develop policies to enforce neutrality among their non-original communities so we avoid more conflicts 
since diasporas are often used to funding these many conflicts. This could be one of you, Dr. Swin and Dr. Besser. Did you hear the question? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, Bahar, you can go. You can, yeah, please. Um, thank you so much, Ashok. I, I was just going to say that um, I think neutrality is impossible for a lot of reasons. Um, because even before uh, conflict generated migration occurs, uh, the host country would have a policy towards the conflict in that uh, specific setting. Um, diasporas can sometimes derail uh, the host country's foreign policy decisions. It happened in the US uh, a few times, like we saw that the Greek diaspora uh, managed to convince the Congress to put sanctions on Turkey. And uh, this was the same for Azerbaijan, thanks to the Armenian lobby, etc. in the past. Uh, so sometimes these things happen, but uh, host countries, uh, whatever they do, it would look like they would take sides. Uh, they firstly act on their interests, and even if they don't, uh, th there is still a limit of what they can do. Uh, I think the best practice is to really understand uh, the root causes of those conflicts, understand the dynamics, rather than treating them as something alien to the new country of residence context, and uh, try to listen uh, to different diaspora groups are, and uh, and uh, listen to what they're saying and uh, minimize uh, triggers and escalation uh, points uh, in, in the host country as much as possible. And I think it is possible. Uh, for example, in my PhD thesis uh, many years ago, I looked at why there was violence between Turkish and Kurdish groups in, in Germany while there was no violence between them in Sweden. Uh, there had been a few occasions in Sweden then which uh, showed the minimum amount of violence, but still uh, I looked at the citizenship regimes, opportunity structures, and I looked at what transformed Turkish-Kurdish relations. And uh, I'm talking about a Sweden where um, uh, when the right-wing party received uh, more than 4% of the votes, people were shocked and people protested. So now this party receives uh, more than 20 percent but those were the times I shook uh, so um many people believed that uh, they could actually um talk to policymakers uh, make their minds uh, you know uh, change their minds in a different way uh, so they chose to act by using conventional ways rather than uh, unconventional methods and they were open to dialogue so as long as the a host country policymakers treat diasporas as perhaps partners in peace building rather than patrons who's going to dictate what they should do. Uh, I think there will be uh, more potential for, for peace, but I don't think neutrality is possible. Uh, Ashok, do you agree with me or? Yeah, yeah. I think I agree completely with your host country analysis, but I think we also need to look at the home country side of the story. Home countries are not really uh, saints in this matter. Uh, we need to look at it, which type of diaspora. If it's a conflict-generated diaspora, then it's difficult to have certain kind of possible good behavior from them in as a group level. Of course, individuals are not blaming individuals, but the group level would be difficult. But if it is not conflict, non-conflict uh, diaspora, then the countries, the home countries, must give that kind of uh, no interference through them in their own internal issues or through them in the external countries where they are. Uh, and I think this has become so much more a role of how home countries or the, where they originate, they do behave. Uh, I, I will give you one example, how what, what this, how the change in dynamics of Indian diaspora took. Um, uh, in, in the, when in the post-independence period, when Nehru, who was the first prime minister, when the, he used to come to the different countries and Indians used to meet him, he used to say that a be better citizen of the country where you live. Uh, you do, I mean, you know, of course you are, uh, you come from India, you go sometimes visit, but you remain as a better citizen uh, where you are and that's your country. Whereas this has changed dramatically now by the Indian leaders that how they treat this diaspora for their own political interests. And that's not the same as Erdogan is doing, same as Egyptians are doing, same is doing done by the uh, Filipinos, you name it, and Ethiopians, you name it. So that's what is happening. And I think we are 
putting uh, blame on the home. I mean, I agree with the host countries are not sense either, but the home countries have, do be a, a huge responsibility how these diaspora are being encouraged or discouraged of behaving or misbehaving in this, uh, contributing the peace, development, peaceful. But if they are conflict generated, then that's a bit more complex there issue. And do we have time for one more question? This is a good question. I think it relates back to Cody and of course it says, I am very concerned about the conflict and jihadist violence that's growing in Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger. For those areas of the country not yet deeply affected by this violence, what recommendations do any of the panelists have for how to integrate peace building into ongoing rural development, agricultural health water programs that depend on community organization? Yeah, I can, I can uh, I mean, uh, uh, I can give a try, but I think I have written something what is going on, particularly in the Sahel region and Africa in general. Uh, we need to realize that, uh, as I mentioned while I was talking, how the who's have been common, the kind of areas in the Western Africa things have become gone out. But I think we need to realize that uh, I see it, what is happening in Africa is actually decolonizing process again when it, the decolonization has not been complete in Africa, particularly in that part. You cannot keep a country up running from Paris. That's not going to be any way any more possible. And I think the people will stand up, people will. You can control some of the elites. You can do that for some period of time. That's why we see the reflections. You, before, the army used to take those countries with the help of the tanks. Army now, army chiefs are t taking over this country on the basis of carry being carried by the people, rather that they don't need any more tanks. Why this is happening? Because we have failed. We, means the political elites, those who thought that we are putting a, uh, a kind of imaginary democracy in those countries, because they were not actually really democratic. This, is good. They, this was being either run from Brussels or run from Paris or from London. That doesn't work. It, it cannot continue to work. And I think this is this is where we see that. And what has happened, the various, well, there has been a huge, um, uh, I had a recently a discussion with this uh, African Union. And I think some of the African people do not like it. But I think we need to realize now it has become a fashion that African problem, African solution. Sounds great. I am absolutely for it. Every country must have. But is the African problem, African problem? If African problem is not African problem, how do you think that Africa will find solution? It's I think the Europe and North America is, you know, washing off their hand from the commit the crimes they have committed in Africa, continue to commit in Africa. This is just saying that African Union will take that responsibility. African Union not. And you are talking about, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just being, because I think these are the things which is, needs to be uh, uh, told clearly because you cannot continue to keep this manner ruling the country and pretending that everything is all right. That doesn't work. And so this is where I think the problem is. I, what in this case, I'm also concerned about the Africa. Africa has a huge potential. Africa, I mean, that's something. So, yeah, I mean, no, everybody knows. But I think Africa needs to be left alone if to not to get, look at the conflicts. What's happening? Sudan. Can you tell that the conflict is happening, what the RSF and the uh, army, is it a Sudanese conflict? Who are involved in there? What is conflict taking place in the conflicts in Ethiopia? Who is involved there? Well, bring in the actors. We are talking about to look at the East. All, all these actors, foreign actors involved. And our, the Uppsala conflict data which came out last year the, about the conflicts, it's a, most of the conflicts have the international uh, background. So if there is an international parts of the conflict, that has to stop. So I think it is, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm taking a lot of time, but I think it is very important. The people of Africa needs to be given the possibility to rule themselves, run themselves, not from the countries in Europe or the Americas would do it. Thank you very much, Dr. Smith. I was actually speaking with a student yesterday about, uh, she was asking me, about peace building, and she asked me last time when you talked about peace building, you mentioned the idea of external factors. Can you explain on that? She said, and and my answer was precisely what Dr. Swain just talked about. 
in conflict analysis, there is something called who is the external player? Are there any external dynamics? We have to make sure that we have analysis and understanding on that. Heather? I just want to add that, you know, a country like Mali, which was one of the questions, you know, Mali has Russia very involved. It's not a European country that's uh, interfering with Mali right now. It's Russia who voted at the Security Council not to extend the sanctions against the peacekeepers. And then they voted to, then they recently just <clears throat> are financing a landmine. So one of the levels of is what we were just talking about, external interference. But I think we often ignore civil society and grassroots communities and how civil society can. Uh, so Civicus is an organization that actually monitors the role of civil society in peace. And I think I think academics in particular, and myself included, we get very caught up in the international scheme of things. And we forget that grassroots communities, building bridges, you, in the chat question, you talked about community projects, agriculture, water, you know, communities need to be more engaged in their own grassroots peacekeeping. And we need to support a lot more, in my opinion, um, sorry, it's not support grassroots initiatives, but understand that a lot of peace can be built grassroots up. It isn't, you know, necessarily diplomacy down, it's grassroots up. So I agree, external interference is very often a problem. But there are a lot of grassroots initiatives that we don't pay attention to that are trying to build bridges and um, maintain local peace. So I share the concern about Mali and the Sahel region. Um, I think it's been an area very interfered with, as have many other countries in Africa. But there are initiatives on the ground virtually everywhere that could be strengthened and honored for their work for civil society, like the role of civil society in peace building. If it was uh, my way, I can let this thing go through the night <laughs> because it's my thing. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we are out of time. Dr. Barr Besser, uh, Dr. Ashok Swain, Dr. Uh, Heather Eaton, I'm grateful for your time. Uh, we have learned a lot and, and I hope this is not the last time we see you with our Cody community. Uh, I hope you can come back. Next uh, December, we don't have a coffee house or webinar because of the holiday. But in January, we will have a coffee house. Uh, the topic of our coffee house and webinar is Sisters of St. Martha, Lifelong Journey of Peace. And the speakers are Dr. Darlene O'Leary and Sister Joanne Oregon. That's my wife. <laughs> I have to, to full disclosure. So uh, we're looking forward to that conversation. Probably Heather, you can come back and join us again one more time. And uh, the rest of you as well, we're looking forward to it. Thank you very much for your time and for your knowledge. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you as well. Thanks to all who are left. And um, Bahar will be in touch. Nice to see you. Thanks.